Keep remembering the golden rule of the satanic Jezebel spirit. Subtle manipulation when weak, overt intimidation when strong. The Catholic Church with the goddess Mary as their figurehead was now very, very strong and therefore very, very intimidating. Whenever anyone protested against the church or didn't fall in line with the dictates of the hierarchy, they were relentlessly hounded to death and it wasn't until 1517 that things finally began to change. Led by Martin Luther and other prominent men like Ulrich Zwingli, a revolt called the Reformation took place. These were men who were sickened by the excesses and corruption of the Catholic Church and who bravely attempted to stand against its might, risking their lives to expose the corruption and deceit and to bring people back to true biblical Christianity. This movement saw millions of people turn away from Roman Catholicism and renouncing the Pope as the spiritual leader of the Church. The invention of the printing press around this time was key as it meant that cost-effective rapid mass production of pamphlets and books could be placed in the hands of individuals in their own language. The printing press opened the flow of information that the Catholic Church had tried to keep shut. People can now see for themselves just how much they had been duped by the system. They can now learn independently about God for the first time in a thousand years. Of course, the Catholic Church did everything in their power to stop these pamphlets getting into the hands of the ordinary man. They tried even harder to stop the Bible itself from being translated into English, or any other language for that matter. Satan knows how powerful the Word of God is. The reformers eventually achieved the translations, but it came at the price of great persecution and even death for those involved. It's worth looking at how it developed to see just how much Satan opposed it and to drive home an important principle. As we noted, by 600 AD, the Word of God had been restricted by the Catholic Church to just one language, the Latin Vulgate. The all-powerful Roman Catholic Church refused to allow the scriptures to be available in any other language, and if anyone was found to be in possession of one, they would be executed. The reason, as we've noted, is very simple. At that time, only priests were educated in Latin. The common citizen was not. If the people couldn't read the Bible for themselves, they were dependent upon the church to tell them what it said. If the church controlled the flow of information that reached the average person, they controlled the average person. The church would have the power to rule without question, the power to deceive and the power to extort money. Nobody could question their biblical teachings because nobody knew for themselves what the Bible actually said. The church capitalized on this forced ignorance between 400 and 1400 AD in the era we now call the Dark Ages. The first handwritten English manuscripts of the Bible were produced in the 1380s by John Wycliffe, an Oxford scholar, professor and theologian who was known throughout Europe for his fierce opposition to Rome. With the help of his followers and assistant, they produced dozens of English translations which were translated from the Latin Vulgate, the only source text available to them at that time. The Pope was so infuriated by this that 44 years after Wycliffe had died, he ordered for his bones to be dug up, crushed and scattered into the river. One of Wycliffe's followers was Johann Hus, who also thought that people should be permitted to read the Bible in their own language. He opposed the tyranny of the Roman Church that threatened anyone possessing a non-Latin Bible with execution. Hus was burned at the stake in 1415, with Wycliffe's manuscript Bibles used as kindling for the fire. The last prophetic words of Hus were, In 100 years God will raise up a man whose calls for reform cannot be suppressed. Almost exactly 100 years later, in 1517, that prophecy came true when Martin Luther nailed his famous 95 Theses of Contention into the church door at Wittenberg. These were a list of 95 issues of heretical theology and crimes of the Catholic Church. Martin Luther went on to be the first person to translate and publish the Bible in the commonly spoken dialect of the German people. Fox's Book of Martyrs records that in that same year, in 1517, seven people were burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church for the crime of teaching their children to say the Lord's Prayer in English rather than Latin. But if the existence of handwritten Bibles was a threat to Rome's power, the invention of the printing press was their worst nightmare. Its inventor, Johann Gutenberg, invented it in the 1450s, and the first book to ever be printed was a Latin Bible, which was printed in Mainz in Germany.
Though he had created what many believe is the most important invention in history, Gutenberg was a victim of unscrupulous business associates who took control of his business and left him in poverty. Nevertheless, the invention of the movable type printing press meant that Bibles and books could finally be effectively produced in large quantities in a short period of time. This was essential to the success of the Reformation and the breaking of the stranglehold of Catholic power. In the 1490s, another Oxford professor and the personal physician to King Henry VII and VIII, Thomas Lineacre, decided to learn Greek. After reading the Gospels in Greek and comparing it to the Latin Vulgate, he wrote in his diary, Either this is not the Gospel, or we are not Christians. The Latin had become so corrupt that it no longer represented the Gospel at all. In 1496, John Collett, another Oxford professor and the son of the Mayor of London, started reading the New Testament in Greek and translating it into English for his students at Oxford and later for the public at St Paul's Cathedral in London. The people were so hungry to hear the word of God in a language they could understand that within six months there were 20,000 people packed into the church and at least that many outside trying to get in. Fortunately for Collett, he was a powerful man with friends in high places, so he amazingly managed to avoid execution. Inspired by Lineacre and Collett, the great scholar Erasmus decided to correct the corrupt Latin Vulgate. In 1516, with the help of printer John Froben, he published a Greek-Latin New Testament. The Latin part was not the corrupt Vulgate, but his own fresh rendering of the text from the more accurate and reliable Greek, which he had managed to put together from half a dozen old Greek New Testament manuscripts that he had acquired. This milestone was the first non-Latin Vulgate text of the scripture to be produced in a millennium, and the first ever to come off a printing press. This 1516 Greek-Latin New Testament of Erasmus focused attention on just how corrupt and inaccurate the Latin Vulgate had become and how important it was to go back to the original Greek and Hebrew languages to maintain accuracy and to translate them faithfully into the languages of the common people. No sympathy for this illegal activity, however, was to be found from Rome. William Tyndale then became the first man to print the New Testament in the English language. Tyndale was a true scholar and a genius, so fluent in eight languages that it was said one would think any one of them to be his native tongue. He is frequently referred to as the architect of the English language, even more so than William Shakespeare, as so many of the phrases that Tyndale coined are still in our language today. Throughout the 1520s, Luther had been using the 1516 New Testament of Erasmus to translate the New Testament into German for the first time. William Tyndale wanted to use the same 1516 Erasmus text as a source to translate and print the New Testament in English, and so he showed up on Luther's doorstep in Germany in 1525 to gain access to it, and by the year's end he had completed his translation. Word of what Tyndale was doing spread round England, and the Catholic Church placed a bounty on his head. He was constantly hunted down. God, however, foiled their plans, and in 1526 the Tyndale New Testament became the first printed edition of the scripture in the English language. Copies of the Tyndale New Testament were burned as soon as the bishop could confiscate them, but copies trickled through and actually ended up in the bedroom of King Henry VIII. The more the king and bishop resisted its distribution, the more fascinated the general public became. The Catholic Church declared it contained thousands of errors and they burned hundreds of New Testaments confiscated by the clergy, while in fact they burned them because they could find no errors at all. At this time people risked death by burning if caught in mere possession of Tyndale's forbidden books. Having God's word available to the public in the language of the common man was fast spelling disaster for the Catholic Church. They were losing their control on access to the scriptures and therefore their power and income was being threatened. They could not possibly continue to get away with selling indulgences or selling the release of loved ones from a church manufactured purgatory. They were on the verge of being exposed as frauds and thieves. Salvation through faith, not works, or financial donations would be understood. The need for priests would vanish through the priesthood of all believers. The veneration of saints and Mary would be called into question. The availability of the scriptures in English was the biggest threat imaginable to the church. Tyndale's courage inspired others during the eleven years that he was hunted. Books and Bibles flowed into England in bales of cotton and sacks of flour. Ironically, Tyndale's biggest customer was the king's men, who would buy up every copy available to burn them. 
Tyndale simply used their money to print even more. In the end, Tyndale was caught after being betrayed by a friend. He was incarcerated for 500 days before he was strangled and burned at the stake in 1536. Tyndale's last words were, O oh Lord, open the King of England's eyes. This prayer was answered just three years later in 1539 when King Henry VIII finally allowed and even funded the printing of an English Bible known as the Great Bible. Two of the men that had been inspired by Tyndale were Miles Coverdale and John Thomas Matthew Rogers. Tyndale had only translated the New Testament, but Coverdale took it upon himself to translate the Old. He teamed it with Tyndale's New Testament, and on October the 4th, 1535, the first complete English Bible came off the press. His associate, John Rogers, went on to print the second complete English Bible just two years later in 1537. It was the first English Bible translated from the original biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek. He printed it under the pseudonym Thomas Matthew, which was in tribute to Tyndale, who himself had used that name while on the run.